Welcome to A Regenerative Future with me, your host, Matt Powers. I'm excited to share with you today an interview I did just a few days ago with Ray Archuleta. You may know Ray for the NRCS and his 30 years of experience working with soil conservation, water quality, all these things with farmers, teaching farmers, traveling all over the U.S., but you might also know him from Kiss the Ground, from the more recent Common Ground video series. I I'm friends with those guys over there. I was at a screening. That's why they gave me a hat. <laughs> might be in the next film. Uh, Finney and I were talking about it. And I was interviewing Ray about his, his whole experience, the holistic perspective behind it. And, and we get into some pragmatic things that uh, can be applied in the garden and at scale timing understanding understanding our farmers more deeply understanding the regenerative ag movement where it is now where it needs to go uh understanding ray's tools sharing tools i share some of the things that i'm doing now uh, that i recently taught ray so so i'm so excited for you to dive into this interview uh ray and i we actually we have a lot more in common than we realized like personally and uh, it was just a really powerful conversation so check it out thank you for being here i i feel like we're at the cusp of an overflowing sea change a renaissance that never was in a way in soil science right now where it's going to just affect all all ag then all food and because the health of the soils health of the plants health of the animals and people we're suddenly going to have food and health have all these related benefits that have been kind of locked out to us and that's part of the reason why there's this epidemic of autoimmune and weakness. And I just think that there's, we're at the cusp. Do you think that's, that's where we're at? Yes, Matt. I think um, we're in a, a revolution. There's a, not only a revolution, but a revolution of change of mind and heart about healing. I think, I think, uh, and, and I'm not embarrassed to say that I think one of the things that we as humans don't think, we don't see things holistically or in symmetry. I think one of a pastor that passed away was Dr. Timothy Keller. He was a very influential person in my life. I'll never forget. Um, he, he made a very profound statement. And for people of belief, uh, it's rarely ever in the radar. It talks about how uh, there's a restoration happening from uh, a healing from the relationship of man to God, man to man, and man to the ecology. That is happening right now. And I think we are not engaged in understanding how that is occurring. I was always part of the gospel of bringing healing, not just to us from a spiritual and emotional and from relationship, but for the land. And it really started with the foundation, Matt, you just talked about was the soil. The soil, we are the soil. We're part of that soil. You know, I tell people we're 90% we're bacteria, 10% you, you're dirt on legs. So don't take it personally, but, but yes, this is, this is what's happening, Matt. And I'm so excited about it. Where, where, yeah. And so where, where did this begin for you? I mean, you said it started with your faith being connected to the soil. Where did that yeah. begin? Well, for me, man, I, since I was 15 years old, I always wanted to ranch. I always wanted to ranch. I, I grew up in New Mexico and I grew up in town like Gabe Brown. We both grew up in town, but we never had an opportunity to have. My dad had a little bit of land, but I used to go spend the weekends on, on uh, or the summers on my uncle's ranch. And I just, that my, that's where it really started for me in agriculture. And then, then I went to ag. I uh, went to school, I uh, did a couple of years of the Peace Corps, I uh, went to college for uh, eight years in agriculture and worked full-time uh, uh, for NRCS. But I think the epiphany, man, I went, you know, I, I've lived in four states, I've been all over the United States. Um, I would say by this end of this 18 months, I've been in eight continents, I mean, six continents. And I think the thing, the epiphany, Matt, where it really changed me that I was, you know, I spent all these years learning agriculture incorrectly. It happened, it happened in Idaho. 
And the epiphany happened there. I started realizing the water was getting, was still polluted. I, I lived in the Idaho side in a little town of Weezer, but I, I worked and I crossed the Snake River every morning because I was a district conservationist in the area agronomist there. And I realized we're not fixing anything, man. And I'm starting to question. And, you know, and I'm starting to say, I was getting very disgruntled. I was very getting very depressed because uh, every time irrigation season, the, the Snake River, that beautiful green river would turn chocolate right there on my border. And the other thing is I could see that farmers struggled to bring in their sons and daughters into the operation. And I couldn't understand why can't we make a good living on 600 prime acres of agriculture? All that, res all that accumulating by divine providence bringing me to that moment made me realize, gosh, uh, I was taught wrong. And, and what brought that to fruition is reading Ellen Savory's book on holistic management and going to Gate uh, Brown's Ranch in 2007, the light came on. All those experiences for that first 15 years and that converging moment, those butterfly effects, I call them, those divine awakening me made me realize, oh my goodness, I missed it, man. Absolutely mm -hmm. missed it. And it wasn't just me. Is I started to realize I was teaching all over the world, all over the country. My peers, those who went to soil science and agronomy, Matt. And so it, it was worse if you had been trained under those, you know, went to college for it. It made it even worse because we were taught these two paradigms, chemistry and physics and the biology and the ecology were kind of, pushed to the side and that was the worst thing ever and it's and it's destroyed our lands literally and in, in on a global scale so i think that's where kind of in a little nutshell how it started for me it was just a journey of watching a lot of suffering and a lot of uh a wasting of money and resources so that's how that journey went amazing so much of my studying has felt like there's a pride cycle at work and we blind we get blind um and there's these time periods where like have you you've read dirt erosion of civilizations right I, I i i got part of it i have the book but i have not read all of it now so there's a part where george washington is railing on american farmers being like if they would actually learn how to farm they wouldn't have to go west Instead, they're destroying the soil. And he was yeah. working on contour plowing. So a little bit like mm -hmm. key line, a little bit like swale, right. but contour plowing, very smart. And this, and Plato and Aristotle both lamented the loss of soil. And it seems like we come to our senses, like in these, these patterns. And, and, and I think that we've actually come to our senses several times in the past hundred years with different individuals trying to rally and bring the call. Um, yeah. but there's seasons, there's times and there's windows. And I think everyone's aligning right now. All the things are aligning. We're remembering the keys from our past. We're, I mean, mm -hmm. we, we've got these examples like Joel Salad and we've got these examples like Gabe Brown, these people who have carried mm -hmm. the torch through dark times so that mm -hmm. we can see that it does work over the long scale. I just, I just wonder, and you're in the thick of it. What is, what is the transitional experience that, that is needed for the farmers who are stuck and don't know what to do to get there or because there's, that's one group. And then there's the group that like, doesn't believe you. Yeah. I think when we first started, Matt, and you saw You've been around, you know, you've known to me for a while and you've known some of my techniques. If it, I, I really think if it wasn't for the rain simulator, the slake test, those tubes, those basic methods of, of teaching. When I first started, Matt, I started with glass containers, acrylic glass clear containers. And I was, uh, see, when I was working for NRCS as the national, I was kind of the national soil health specialist going all over the it was called soil quality specialist. 
and I'll never forget my first talk. I went to Pennsylvania and I was shaking. I was, I was, I don't like being in front of public. I didn't like speaking. I had speech impediment, but I'll never forget when I used those glass jars and those, and those, and those plastic containers and the, the, the response of the landowners was mind boggling. It was kind of like the soil speaking. I finally realized that it, you have to let the soil speak. And when the water doesn't go into the soil and, you know, you pour it and you use little glass jars and you see that the soil breaks up because it's, it's, it doesn't have its integrity anymore, ecological integrity and its biological integrity and its chemical integrity and their own function. The farmers go like, wow. I think I spend Matt, a majority of my time getting farmers to understand this basic concept of the soil's alive basic functionality, basic concepts. And once they realize that it's alive, there's a huge paradigm shift. It shatters everything they've been taught from generation, what they've been socially conditioned, what they learned from the universities, what they learned from their schools, what they learned from their peers. I let the sh soil speak. In fact, I'm going down to Nicaragua and we're taking the big rain simulator. And we're going to do the same thing because I have a couple of minutes, Matt. I have a couple of minutes where the people, then they're ready. Once we have that foundation, then we can talk about transitioning. We are at a very, very low level of understanding in this country how the soil works, including myself. When I say this with humility, I do not say this with disrespect. Please understand it has nothing to do with intelligence. It has everything to do with not being exposed with the right science. And I, I think we need to develop that. And when we talk about what do you mean by right science? And, um, and I tell people, if you're not asking the right questions, and if your science is not based on the simple question, that's why I love Janine Benius's uh, website it's called Ask Nature. How does nature do it? The science that we've done for the last 60, 75 years, 100 years in this, in this country is how do we force nature? Mm -hmm. How do we manipulate it genetically, chemically, physically? Biomimicry, agroecology, permaculture says, no, 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 no. How do you work with it? How do you mimic it? How do you emulate it? How do you design it? How, I mean, how do you have a relationship? Total different, asking different questions. That's the premise that we're, we got now. We finally, I feel, communicated the correct premise. And, which, and I think that's part of the whole battle map is getting the right paradigm. I completely agree. And I feel like you got that message out there because when I started doing my work with regenerative soil, I felt like it was all inverted. And I was like, the universities are blasting us with information, but they're getting it from this tiny little subset of information. Meanwhile... <laughs> The inverse is what we really need. We need everyone to contribute to the data yeah. so that we can see what soil is actually like and let it just speak to us. So I, yes. think, we're, I think that the, the, the paradigms are flipping. People are recognizing that they've been focused on the wrong thing. I mean, the fact that John Kemp, speaking of John, as we were earlier, John Kemp's introduced these ideas that like, oh, well, the NPK, um, that's your problem. You know, because so many of these farmers have just been putting it on without ever checking or thinking about the non-soluble buildup of phosphorus or thinking about mm -hmm. how nitrates cause disease pressure and everything. Um, and it's like, yeah, there's time and place for everything. But when there's too much, there's too much. And yeah. and it's that 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 flipping of paradigms where there's like, oh, more is not better always, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, um, We've had teachers about a couple hundred years ago, uh, I mean, you know, close to 100 years now, been saying those things for a long time. Um, and I think John has tapped into that. And all of us, thank, thank goodness, Matt, people like you that write, that give that labor of love and write books down. If it wasn't for the, the, the researchers that wrote these books down, like Patrick Lavelle on solar ecology or those a lot of books that I read, uh, uh, Alan Savey, all of these books, if somebody hadn't written them down for me to pick them up and, 
and learn from them and then go apply it in the fields or go help farmers, I'd be lost. And so uh, writing, uh, we're very fortunate the written word books are very critical. And, and, it's, and it gives us foundations to push, uh, to, to be able to teach others. So, you know, Matt, right now in this country where we're at, we are not at the, people think we're at early adopter stage, but really, at, we're really at early innovator stage. We're less than one or two, three percent. And until we reach 13% of the farmers in the country, we're not going to get that complete change where we get the rest of the other 60 some percent, the uh, late adopters to come. And so that's what we're at. Because you talked about transition. That's where we're at. We're not, we, we're still at early innovator stage in, in regenerative agriculture, but it's growing fast. Yeah. And then the, the financials going along with it, common ground, that whole 20 minutes where it goes over the financial success of transitioning the, all the different examples. It's uh, for me, I mean, it's like, it, it feels like a part of the weight on my shoulders has like been shifted onto theirs too. And I'm like, oh, you can carry this load together. And yeah. that's, that's what's happening increasingly. There's more and more people showing up. What's, what's the most fascinating thing to me is I didn't expect everyone else to be as enthusiastic and excited about soil and microscopy as I was. Like I fell in love with it. I got so excited and I... And I don't know exactly why, like I, I, it's the leverage, it's the leverage point and the linchpin to everything totally. But I think there, there's something special. I think that people recognize that this is the subject of the moment in a way it touches everything. It's the, uh, I call it the foundation resource, Matt, without that, nothing else works. And I think that I, I was one time, one night I was reading a researcher and I wish I could remember because he really deserves the credit. He says, the plant and soil are one. I come screaming out of my uh, the bedroom because I was reading in my room, my my book and the technical book. And I said, why the soil, the plant and soil are one. And she looks at me, she goes, oh my God, I married that man. But <laughs> what was so prof and she goes, and she, what was so profound about that is if you take the plant out, you have no soil biology. If you have no soil biology and you have no plant biology, you have no life. It, it, you just have geology. And I, I think we disconnected that. And I think another thing, one, I'll never forget the statement. It was beautifully said. The ancients said, Matt, the plant is the mouth of the soil. It's the mouth. Wow. Without it, it, it doesn't feed. It doesn't eat. And I'm still struggling getting farmers just to get away from fallow, to not leave it, not to leave it uncovered. I tell them, I said, can you imagine getting your little baby child and putting duct tape and said, okay, don't eat for another nine months. That's what we're doing in agriculture. And, and so we're not feeding this incredible array that you see every day on that microscope map that you spend so much time and you did, so, you know, and showed in your books. That's what we're dealing with, Matt. Yeah. That's the level that we're at. Yeah. I mean, lately I've been trying to get folks to really frame mycorrhizal fungi differently, not as an inoculant, as more as a return of an evolutionarily derived partnership. So it's the other half of the plant. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I think so many farmers see it as an investment. They're like, Oh, well, that's like, I don't know if that's, if I'll get the return on investment, that's extra money. And I'm like, that's the other half of the plant this is why we have diseases. Like we do. This is why. And yeah. when people, when people say, you know, roots, you know, it's 10,000 times more surface area with mycorrhizal fungi. It's like, actually, no, no, no. plants are normally have 10,000 times more surface area. And it's only when they're lacking their biology that they have less. Yeah. And it's that inversion that I see everywhere. And it's flipping those paradigms one after another. Yeah. That's a, that's a good way of putting it, Matt, because, you know, when we first started this talk, to, we communicate, we brought farmers in economically, eco, the house. 
but as they got to learn about their ecology, the eco, the house, the study of the house, the biology and the microbes and everything, once they understood the ecology, they start, I mean, once they started making money and they started changing, they started falling in love with the ecology. Every farmer now, Matt, that I have been in the regenerative movement, I go, wow, Ray, I love farming now. Yeah. It's it. I love it. I'm. I get it. I'm. I'm gaining it, and and they 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 start having a love affair. So we draw them economically, Matt. But later on, they fall in love with the ecology, and they find out well, the ecology should have always been first, and the economics will follow. Especially on farming, you have to follow the natural systems patterns or rules, or you're just going to go broke. So there was a paradigm shift that has to happen, and it has, and it is happening. And it's growing globally. Do you see that that deep change, that secondary deep change that's internal affecting farmers to farmer to farmer more than the economics? Yeah, and I'll tell you why, man. You know what I realized as I go all over the world, and you know, I could tell I just got back from Australia. People that are very intentional emotionally uh, in their inner core they're the ones that follow through they'll stick through they it takes a special person to really carry it through and follow through um, a lot of people start with regenerative agriculture and they and they and they fall apart they 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 lose encouragement they lose they give up too quickly and that's why I've gotten to a point uh, to a point when I talk to a large group of farmers, man, I'll tell them, I said, please don't start this. Don't go do cover crops if you're going to do it half ways. If you're going to do cover crops, like if you don't treat your cover crops like your main crop, you don't even start. Just go home and still be addicted to your and be a slave to your your chemicals, your fertilizer and 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 and, and the debt. Just go home because you're not committed. You have to have it inside, Matt, that you really got to do with all your heart and mind and being. It's got to reach that deep because it can't be a superficial thing because I'm going to tell you regenerative agriculture is way more difficult in management and in thinking. You have to think. You mm -hmm. have to manage. And so if, if you're not willing to do that, then you know what? You're just playing. Just, just go home. It, you're you're just you're going to do it half-heartedly and then you're going to prevent others because you're going to go out to the local community and you're going to diss cover crops you're going to diss all this stuff and you're going to and you're going to prevent others from coming into the kingdom of soul health wow just don't do it and be committed and if you're not committed because i'm telling you one committed person can change a whole community i've seen it over and over again so you have to be committed. It's not, it's not a superficial thing. Man. I feel like that we have to be that way in life. And I feel like that, that element is what I was talking about with my older son. Um, and we're fostering with my our, our second young, our second son right now. That is the, the key to really mastering yourself, mastering, you know, your craft and uh, succeeding in life. Uh, and it's the meaningful pursuit. I think that in so many ways, our systems and our, our in our culture right now lack fundamental, true integrity, true meaning. And when we bring those things back, when we realign integrity to the role, whether, you know, we're talking about the person who, you know, landscapes, you know, in your in your local town or talking about someone who has a farm or talking about someone who does the compost or or even just a regular mundane job it's the integrity component i think that uh is such a healing co because the, with the science has always it's in a way always been there and it's and now they have the ability to make those right choices it's such a, it's a powerful thing i think people don't recognize that regenerative soil has that component the integrity component uh, you can't separate it matt in fact the word 
that when I first started using the word regenerative comes from really from the book of Colossians where be renewed, the word renewed in heart and mind, you're a renewed person. Regenerative agriculture starts with you being renewed inside. And, and that's when I started using the word regenerative agriculture. That's what I understood as re regenerative agriculture is a renewal yes. of you. And it, that's how the land becomes renewed. The land is destroyed because of us. The land renews itself every day. So it's it really, you, you really hit on the part, Matt, of, of integrity, and it starts with you. The land will not, your farm will not change if you're not going to change. It will not. Sorry, it won't. And, and, and some people do it from an economic perspective. I get it. That's fine. But at the end, but the, but if you're going to do that, you still have to follow those ecological principles that were designed by the creator. You either follow them or you go broke. It's on you. I, I'm, I, I've learned, I don't play God. I give you the science and I show you how it and, and teach you that and let it work and let it be. I love that. So do you want, could you share with us some, some success stories, some turnarounds? Oh, Oh, absolutely. I, uh, I mean, it, that would take a, a, a day, but let me tell you something. Let me tell you some of the ones that have been so personal to me. I'll, I'll never forget, Matt. I still remember this, this, the situation. Um, uh, it was in, it was in North Carolina. There was a guy, I can, wish I could remember the farmer's last name is John. I'll never forget. He's like 71 years old. I'll, I'll, I'll share an expression. It doesn't matter about age. He came to a class that I was teaching, and there was a 38-year-old farmer sitting right next to each other. And we were teaching. They heard the same message. The 71-year-old man got it, and he, he went back home, sold all his tillage equipment, and, bought cover, and, and started using cover crops. A year later, because the 38-year-old didn't get it, that 71-year-old man, I can't, John, what do you think of farming now? And he goes, oh, Ray, I love it. Think about what he did, John. He's 71 years old, sold all his tillage equipment. Do you know what commitment and bought a, and got himself a no-till planter and a drill? Huh. That was a financial investment. That man changed, every, he changed everything. And just because of one week, a, a one-time talk. I also remember the, uh, when we went to Indiana, Barry Fisher and I did it. And this one, we're using little glass jars and that. And there was a group of 50 to 100 farmers in Indiana. And there was a farmer, Mark, Mark Ensign. Uh, Mark, I'll never forget Mark. And Mark farmed 20,000 acres. And he was, the back, he was in the back. And he heard Barry and I speak. And we would, after we did the little conference, we drove about an hour out. We get a phone call from this guy named Mark. And Mark says, Ray, I mean, Barry, I want to do a thousand acres of cover crops and no-till. Change the whole farm. He says, if, if I had not gone to that workshop, he says, I was going to give up on farming. Yeah. On 20,000 acres. And I'll share another story real quick. Is uh, went to Guatemala. And um, this is a 50,000 acre sugar cane. They asked me, they saw Kiss the Ground documentary and says, hey, Ray, can you come and help us with the regenerative agriculture? And it was Herman Jensen. I'll never forget. Herman Jensen watched Kiss the Ground maybe four or five, six, seven times. And he called me and, and, and I had, they have, Santa Ana Mill has 80 agronomists on staff, Matt. 80. Wow. 5,000 employees. They provide one third of the electricity for the sugar cane for the Guatemala, Guatemala City. And uh, I took my, and, and Matt, I took my little rain simulators down there and did my whole, it took two visits. And they, all the agronomists went through a paradigm shift. All of them. Now they're saving money on herbicide. We're going down next week again, uh, the following two weeks. Uh, they are moving to be one of the first regenerative sugarcane mills where they're going to back off on the fertilizers, the pest, the herbicides, and the chemical. 
and start using cover crops. They started already planting buffer strips. Matt, that was two to three. This is going to be the third visit. And look what they've done. And it was just a matter of giving the right paradigm shift and letting the soil speak to them and learning how to give and deliver the message, Matt. And, and, but the credit goes to them. I'm just a messenger. I, I, I'm just a messenger of a message that makes sense. Mm-hmm. That make, what part do we not understand? All we're asking in the regenerative movement is how can you mimic nature? Yeah, in her design, it's a simple message, Matt. But yet it gets it 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 boggles my mind how we make it so complex. Yeah, it's really it's it's really wild. I think, I mean, I think a big part of it's the education and the entertainment. Yep, and, and it maybe, is education. Yeah, yeah. So I think that if we just immerse more people uh, in man i love the fact that the the water quality the the glass jars the soil uh percolation because i remember seeing that years ago and that is a perpetual meme online that is like always always being shared forever (laughs) that and you know i call i'm going to uh in two weeks i'm going to nicaragua we're going to do on the largest tobacco cuban tobacco farmer in the world he called me. He wants to go regen. So he's got 7,000 acres. And I said, okay, I'm not going down there, Nestor, without the rain simulator. We were going to bring the big rain simulator down there. Because think about it. Nestor believes it. But his, we got to teach his dad. got to teach his agronomist. And I said, everybody comes to the training. There is no, there is no. Uh, option you will be there we set the tone the whole first day man is destroying all our paradigms all our views we've learned in our college education what we've learned from our schools all our social conditioning from our churches our schools our communities we had a wrong view of soils and so the rain simulator and those plain little tubes they, they destroy it. And then we go out there with a shovel in the field. So unless I do that first, there is no moving to the transition part, Matt, period. Wow. There is no transition. That's how I approach it. It's I let the soil speak to them. And I just let those demonstrations speak. And they're like, I had one man in Venezuela when he first saw the rain simulator. He just like, he just in front of there's a group of 60, 70 people there. And he just blared out. He just couldn't help it. He goes, oh, crap, he says. Huh. But he said it in Spanish. He goes, I'm screwed. He goes, I just, what am I going to do? Oh. And I told him, I said, and I said, nothing. It's too late this year. Wait this coming year and start your cover crops. But it has that kind of effect, Matt. When you do that, then they're ready. Then they're ready to build them from them. And then from then, you need people like you, man, and people like can hold their, all of us that can hold their hand during that journey. We don't have enough teachers. We just do not have enough teachers to take them down. I spend my majority of my time as a counselor, not mm-hmm. a consultant. We're counselors. And and, and nobody teaches you how to deal with the human mind and how to deal with the human heart. Mm-hmm. And you, 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 we think that science is this cold cut thing and you just give them data. I'm sorry, that doesn't work. Nobody's, nobody will, will do the energy or, or do the most incredible things because the science, they did it because of the science. No, they did it because of love and passion and caring for the people, but it also helps to have the right science that's asking the right questions, right questions. That's how this works. I think that concept may have been in the back of my mind. Your, your, your samples, having the good sample, bad sample, and mm-hmm. running them simultaneously. 
that must have been in the back of my mind when I when I was I was telling you the other day about side by sides, the strips yep. of the hemocytometer. The the only drawback is you have to be able to video edit, <laughs> yeah. so that you have yeah. section or, or or you crop your pictures. But it's so different when you actually can have the microscope let it move and shimmer and the microbes move because you can actually see them better. But that yep. idea of a guiding metric, a guiding standard changes everything. And whether it's the person in your community or whether it's the soil in the tube or whether, you know, it's the one that glows the least with the dye, right, that we were talking about. No. We need to shift to looking at who are the exemplars and why? And and I always say, what in my classes I always say, you know, what's most natural? And and that that kind of like really corrects people, really brings people back to reality. Because with the, with the way that things have been done with soil science and soil testing, especially with microscopy, it's very difficult for it to be that aha. Very difficult for it to be that like oh. I see where I am and see where I need to go. But with your design, the, having that guiding metric, that guiding yeah. standard, I think we're going to see more of that. Um, and folks who are listening to this, if you can think of a way to show people something that's so obvious that uses a real example, a guiding standard, do it. Because that's what we need most right now. And, and I'll tell you what, Matt, if I was teaching your class, first thing I do is start off with my, my little rain simulator. Because without, people want to know function. Yeah. It, the soil function, it infiltrates water, it holds water. That function can't be done without the biology. Biology creates the function of the soil. Who ever thought that porosity Bulk density is dynamic. It's biology does that. And so you have to bring it that. And that's what farmers care about. At the end of the day, does the water enter? Do I get water cycling and nutrient cycling? At the end of the day, that's what they care about. And you can kind of, that's why when I, I go talk to groups of farmers, I can only do so much bio, biology with them because they just get glossy eyed. I, I give them just enough an appreciation, and then as they get more and more hungry and they learn to develop, then that, you know, that will, that will, it will change. That will change. And so, um, but that's why I start off with those things because at the end of the day, basic function. And, and you think that everybody's at the same level that you, that uh, you are, uh, that they understand they're not. They think they do, but they don't. And I don't care if you have a PhD in soils or not. It really doesn't matter. But I've seen we all we all lack uh, knowledge from this very complex, most complex ecosystem, one of the most complex ecosystems on the planet. So so it takes time to understand that. That's why I use my basic my basic demos first. I don't care what how much what your education level is. It really doesn't matter. That's awesome. And I think that it's what it is, is it's authentic learning. It's experiential learning. So it really cuts through all those words and all those books that they've read that were abstractions. I mean, so much of, of the textbooks I had to read to do my work were just block text. Like they would describe a cycle with no images, no reference to anything concrete that you could visualize for the most part for pages and pages. It's just chemistry, you know, and it's difficult. It's definitely difficult. But the wild thing is it turns into the actual physical reality that everyone can undeniably recognize. Do you have, um, do, do you have like, so, so that's how you introduce things when someone is past that stage, when they're doing it, when they have cover crops, when they're building soil organic matter, when they're, they're wanting to go to the next level, what do you usually do? The one thing I've I've learned is to listen and see where they're at. We walk in the field. We go with a shovel. We always take that shovel. I, I have this saying about the shovel. There's a saying they, that the eyes are the windows to the soul. 
the shovel is the window to the soul of the soil. That's how I pierce into it and see. And and that's why uh, uh, I think a person that really helped me a lot is, uh, I call him Dr. Aggregate. Uh, um, uh, he, he was a great, he's a great researcher. And uh, Johan Six. And, and there's been some great literature that's really helped me to realize that, hey, my gosh, the soil has design. So I'll go walk out there with a shovel and see how the design is progressing, that all those five spheres are present in the soil. And and without those five spheres present, you're not going to have effective water cycling and nutrient cycling. Who would have thought that the climate is connected, the rain, the water cycle is connected to an aggregate mat, <laughs> that it ends with an aggregate? Who would have thought of that? If the water doesn't get in, it, the water runs off and you have an effective water cycle and it affects the climate, it affects everything else. And And so I go out there and I guide them through that process and where they're struggling with. I think once you start going to the no-till and the covers, the biggest struggle is nutrients, getting enough nutrient cycling and weed suppression. Mm-hmm. Weed suppression is a huge biggie. How can we do it without chemicals? How can we reduce the herbicides and the fungicides and all these other things? That's, that's a big struggle right there. Do you recommend like the steam weeder systems or flame weeding? What do you recommend in that situation? And in, 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 in what I do, Matt, what I recommend is um, rolling the cover crops down, finding a cover crop that will create a blanket and create that does biomimicry that creates this blanket like the forest system. And so I wish my dog would go away, but uh, my daughter's dog, we've been taking care of it for the same. But here's the, what I do is what we do is a cover crop is like, for example, if we're doing corn and soybean. I like to roll cereal rye, um, triticale and hairy veg. How can we um, roll it down? And that's what I prefer to do first. And you can terminate the cover crop by rolling it down once to your ride which is a senescence and you see that pollinating uh those uh those pollinating um uh, pollen coming down it's ready to roll and it's easy to, and it's easy to terminate without campus so that's really important so with like a crimper yes a crimper roller i'm gonna Beautiful. move out here and and so because that dog is messing up our recordings i didn't I apologize. hear him. oh good good oh you didn't <laughs> No, it didn't. Good. Good. But but and yeah, so, so so that's so that's very much like what I do. I smother things with like cow peas and I take areas and I just I, I overwhelm it with a cover crop. And I do some weeding when I'm like actually physically planting by hand in areas, but I tend to do larger spans by hand and I always try to smother it, always try to overwhelm. And I think, um, I think that there with a lot of, uh, fix it gardeners, they want to like get in there and do everything, but it's that patience, that larger scale cycling that we participate in where it's, it's a way easier on your back, but also, um, it's just, it obeys a very special pathway. I mean, when you do that crimping rolling over, you create that, that, that buffer between the top and the bottom between the soil and the top of that mulch okay. layer. And because the roots are still in there, there's the, 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 the decomposition goes down into the ground. Yeah. So it's very different. I think that people don't realize the potency and power of that. Would you ever flail mow that? Uh, no, because no. I, I, I don't like it because what it does, it scatters the material and, and, and it creates this fragmentation and allows a light to penetrate. Now, uh, do I, uh, no, I shouldn't say it that way. It depends on the crop. It mm. depends how much control you want. Um, now, I've seen where uh, Virginia Tech did it. They ran a filet more and they and they terminated but when you do do that fillet and mowing, let me tell you, I learned a really brutal experience when one producer did that. He ran a mower, and when he turned it up in shreds and all that green material, 
and depending if, and if it had too much uh legumes in it it allowed the nitrogen release from the from the cover crop real quick and then the weeds proliferated right. and so it, it and it created a explosion of weeds so let's back up a little bit man i think something that the, the audience needs to know that that we call that blanket I, scientists call that blanket called detritus sphere that's the detritus sphere all healthy ecosystems so ecosystems the forest has leaves that's the detritus sphere that's that i call it skin and then uh if you go to prairies and you pull the the prairie grasses you'll have that skin it's always there it's there for weed suppression it's there for feeding the microbes it's a habitat and then in that interface in that skin it creates aggregation right there right there a researcher from brazil said hey right look pull that skin and you'll see aggregates form from from the beginning of that skin it cools it it's fungi it's uh my gosh uh, the detritus sphere is so critical by laying that cover and creating that instant blanket um uh, it's beautiful. It, it does, and there's uh, you have aggregates all the way down, prevents crusting. Um, that skin is important. If you go to your lawn, if your audience, somebody in your audience goes, Oh, I want to see that detritosphere, go to your front lawn, move the grass blades, and right in the middle, you'll see that, that dry material, that old uh, leaf material that's called the detritosphere. So, who would have thought, Matt, that? We are now doing millions of acres now, and we're rolling that cover down, creating that instant skin, and it changes the soil temperature. There, there are so many things that that skin does. So what you've been doing on your garden is absolutely the correct. It's mimicking the natural system. Who would have thought that, right? I love it. I, I was in California right above Fresno for so many years, and so when I started growing, I took my compost thermometer, stuck it in the soil and was like, oh, bare soil is 140 degrees when it's 112 out because it's, you know, straight sun yeah. that compounds the heat. And then I was like, I'm going to water this. It only went down 15 degrees when I watered because, of course, we're in California and our water tanks are above ground. So it's it's 112. Water. <laughs> so it's like yeah. it doesn't it doesn't go, you can't cool anything off. Everything's hot here in the foothills. And then I started doing cover crops and then I started doing a layer of mulch and I got it to go down to 78 degrees from 140. So, so this, this is so powerful and potent, but I think the, 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 the rolling, the crimping, I think is a, an investment that a lot of people don't think about, but that connection to the root, that connection to keeping the plant whole, that bouncy, airy layer between them is so critically important i think because it slows it down in a way too you're you're allowing other cycles to happen yeah. i i was doing sheet mulching on certain properties where i would just be doing like essentially flail mowing in place adding a little bit of compost adding biochar and then tarping and you know what i mean composting in place and that's that's cool you know what i mean that's like a jean martin fortier kind of thing but but this is so much easier. This is so much m definitely more powerful because of it preserves that layer, especially at the fall, you know, going into winter. And think about this, Matt, if you're doing it on thousands of acres. I mean, I'm talking about large operations that yeah. are doing this. And and it's interesting that it's like the 1,000 to four or 5,000 to 10,000 acre farmers are catching this. They're doing this quicker the name is some of the smaller operators and because the costs are so incredible, but think about also too, when you lay that skin down as it's breaking down uh, about 65% of that material goes back into CO2 and in the back of the leaf is tomato. So you're actually increasing CO2 and increasing more sugars and more energy and increasing yields. You cool the soil surface, you're breaking that residue up, that skin, it's releasing to the back of the bottom of the plant. Oh my gosh, you, you're feeding a huge array. You're protecting what it, uh, I think it was Mike or Dr. Jonathan Lundgren said, 70% of all insects life cycle is 
continued in that first one or inch, two inches of the soil. This is this is such a big point. This is so, I'm so glad you said that. I've been telling folks for years that in our past, when we had vibrant ecosystems with multi-level, multi-storied um, canopies, CO2 release from decomposition or exhalation from fungi was captured in situ right there. It didn't go all the way to the ice cores, which means that we need to be more efficient with our cycling by just bringing back nature. And it will oh, have yep. more, more CO2 cycling, but it will be way more efficiently and it'll read as less, even though it's more that's going through the system. It's just more efficient. Yeah. And it was interesting. A friend of mine just passed me a research paper I read it about two or three months ago. It was about, talking about water vapor, you know, evaporation. Uh, they couldn't figure out. It just was the math wasn't working out. And I don't know if you saw that paper. Oh, yeah. I see you're nodding your head. You probably saw that. And it was kind of like, wow, we we left one part of the equation. We couldn't figure out, okay, something's not right. And it was, came back to light and the albedo effect and how the surface of the of the soil, the surface and the colors make difference and photons, that light energy, those energy packets also caused more evaporation. So we were missing part of the equation. Oh yeah, it's all heat. No, it's not all heat. It's about if you don't have the ground covered with the right color, like plants, uh, you're gonna affect <laughs> evaporation. And, and so, you know, I'm beginning to realize that, uh, you know, back to the climate, I think, or, and, and to build a climate, I think agriculture single-handed can fix the climatic instability that we have right now. Agriculture by itself can do it. Even if we did it, not, and now please don't misunderstand. I don't want people on the island going, oh, but we got to fix it in CO2. And I said, look, please understand CO2. We need CO2 in the atmosphere. We need these gases because we would be a frozen block of ice. Think of it as a blanket. But the problem, that's not the real cause. We're missing the mark. Agriculture covers a huge portion of the surface of the land. Over 20 to 30% of our land is bare soil. Gets that, Matt? 20 to 30%. Too much sensible infrared light going to the, and, the, and it's increasing the heat. We're missing the mark. And so I think... This is why soil science and what we're doing here, Matt, and teaching is so critical. This can fix the climatic issue. When I talked to Dr. V uh, Mr. Vilsack and Secretary of Ag in the United States, I said, Mr. Vilsack, on a Zoom meeting, if we could do one thing, one thing only, cover the ground. Let's just cover the ground. And so that when we drive in the fall and into the winter, we're not looking at the moonscape. Mm. I'm telling you, Matt, California, all the way to North Carolina, you go, and you go anywhere in this country in the winter, it's bare. And then the wind blows. Yes. And it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be bare. It should be, yeah. it should be, it should be green. We have plants now like cereal rye, triticale, all those are winter. It should be green. And we, it's, it's a real simple thing to fix cover the ground i people get into this carbon issue i'm not into this carbon issue i'm into biodiversity that's right i tell people the remember i was you and i were talking about it and you got it in your book and i love the way you talk about it. the software of the planet is biodiversity it's the insects it's the microbes it's the viruses it's the animals it's the all these creatures they run the soft the hardware they run this rock and so I love the way you did that in your book. And that's why I, 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 I say, you know, the audience buy Matt's book. Matt did a really good, simple way of teaching graphically. And so, and by the way, Matt didn't pay me to say that. I just, I did that <laughs> because I, I really, really appreciate what he's done with his book and how to teach. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh we are in a, a very wild situation in many ways because our groundwater is disappearing. Colorado river is depleting. We have all these things that if we just stopped using that much water because the yep. soil now doesn't need that much water because our soil health is up. 
we can start taking the stress back from, we can take the stress off some of those resources and then apply these same exact soil based concepts to restoring the Sierra Nevadas to store restoring all these wild areas that foster the water that we get in America and all yes. over the world too. And so I, I believe you're completely right. Bringing back nature, bringing back the natural watersheds, bringing back the wetlands. I mean, California used to flood all the way from Tulare to Sacramento and you could paddle a boat all the way up because it flooded so much. And, and we could have that back, but that's the thing. We need to bring nature back if we want nature's benefits back. Yeah, and I think people don't realize, Matt, that uh, the soil itself holds more water than all the rivers and lakes put together. It's in that pore. We want to hold, I tell them, the water cycle is complete when the water goes in the soil. We don't have a runoff problem. We have an infiltration problem. And without aggregates, living plants, biology creating aggregates to create the pore, too much water is running off too quickly. That's our issue. And then bizarre, if you look at the, Mississippi watershed, I'll never forget when I went to go speak to a bunch of engineers, their solution is let's build bigger dikes. Well, that's ridiculous. Why don't we address the raindrop the moment it lands and cover the soil and create aggregates and let the water infiltrate? That's the solution. So a lot of our climatic issues is the fact that our soils are not functioning. That's the issue, man. And you know the aquifer too. Yeah, and the, and the charging of the aquifers, and 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 it it's all boils back to this one thing. Let's look in the mirror. We're the problem. Yeah, it's the way we understand it, and it's the way we look at that. And let's let's also talk about this, man. And I think it's the elephant in the room. Nobody wants to hear this. When when COVID came out, I got to I got so sick of hearing this one statement. But I got the science. And I almost want to buy a T-shirt, Matt, and says, and I say, I trust the science. And I, says, and I hate that statement because I'll say, yeah, I trust the science, dot, dot, depending who paid for it. Right. And depending who paid for <laughs> it, follow the stinking money all the way to it, and you'll find out. Because please understand that the agriculture that we created, this modern construct, this mechanized agriculture, this current model was based on science too. It was science asking wrong questions. It was science asking the wrong question. Just because you use science doesn't mean you're asking the right questions. The science should have been, how do we mimic nature? Yeah. How do we build our cities? They should emulate the natural system. It's science asking wrong questions. Science misapplied. And so, uh, let's be honest about it. It's about it's about money, and 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 the, and the and the current construct doesn't want to change because you sell things to farmers. Regenerative agriculture, if you do it right, you don't need anything. You need a plant and a cow, and biology. <laughs> what else do you need? It's a miracle, and that's the thing is that feel it, the more the more I dig into it, the more I learn about soil science, the more I learn about regenerative ag. It's our birthright to know how to live this way because this is the way we're supposed to live. We're supposed to live in this pattern. We're supposed to live in yeah. within the patterns of nature and 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 be able to see clearly that what we're doing is helping, that what we're doing is the right thing so that we can feel good about who we are. It has to be this congruency, this transparency so that we can see ourselves properly as we participate with, with creation. Oh, it was, it's beautiful, Matt, because really, when I walk on the field, I should hear beauty, see beauty. I should see the garden of Eden. We were all designed for the garden. We love beauty. Your, 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 your aura, your, your inner being, if, you, if you're in a bad mood, go walk in a beautiful multi-species mix where there's bees everywhere. Your attitude changes. We were designed for that, man. Just like you eloquently just said a couple of minutes ago, we're designed for that. And so that's why farmers start falling in love with this type of system. You said, like, you are coming back to your point. Well, how do you, okay, you got, you're doing the covers because there's going to be some critical moments. And I think one of the things we need to talk about is 
when you transition these people, I start to realize you're better off starting really slow and start off until you feel comfortable on the logistics. Now, what do I mean by logistics? When you roll the cover crop in time, when you spray in time, when you do, in, because you, you've got to do these things timely. And I've had a lot of people say, well, Ray, you still, you know, you still work with farmers that still use herbicide, Roundup, and chemicals. And I said, yes, I do. I said, because I don't focus on the tool. I focus on the understanding of the producer. Please understand, when the soil gets healthier, I can wean him off the tool slowly. Yeah. I don't want him to go broke. I hear a lot of people say, I, I'll, I'll never forget when I do my, I did this in Taos, and I did my rain simulator, and I told him, I said, Soils can handle an acute stress, but they can't handle chronic stress. They can handle an occasional herbicide. They can handle an occasional tillage, but they can't handle it chronically. And a lady asked me, but Ray, farmers are still using Roundup. I said, yeah, I'm not a big supporter of Roundup. I said, but I got to work my farmer. I have farmers that went from five Roundups down to one Roundup. From five herbicides down to one herbicide. It's a journey. And that's what happened to Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka said, well, I want to get rid of, we're going to get rid of all the chemicals. We're going to do this all at one time. Fertilizer, people went hungry. Yeah. It collapsed. We're going to go straight organic. I said, no, you've got to gradually, these soils are addicted to all these, uh, to all these chemicals and fertilizer because they're simplified. They don't work. They're not functioning anymore. And to the ability that it should, and so people make these very, very blank statements and they think they're going to help the farmer. And yet, yes, I don't want Roundup in my food. I don't want it in my groceries. Yes, my wife's been, all of us have contamination. We don't want that. But please understand it's a journey and how we're going to break up, you know, the feedlots and these huge things. We, it took us 70 years to put us here and we're going to, it's going to take us years to get along, uh, get out of that. And one thing I want to say to the audience, man, it's easy to go out there and criticize the farmer who has, the, has that big CAFO, that big confined feeding operation. But please understand who created that. Universities created it. We said, get bigger, get out. USDA said, get bigger, get out. You can't meet the market, get bigger, get out. We wanted cheap food. A lot of people left the, the farm. They don't want to work hard. So understand, we all created the system. It's not going to be fixed overnight. So context, context, context. You've got to work with farmers when they can. So I started backing off on pillage, backing off on the chemicals, backing off on this, that I don't go over there and pound you on the top of the head because you're using them. No, I want to know if you understand and use them discreetly and wisely and work your way out of them slowly. Because Matt, it just adds to your next point. How do I transition the farmers? You know what the hardest transition is? Besides when we start off to the covers? How to get farmers off the fertilizer slowly and the chemicals. That takes skill. That's your answer, man. I know we went all around the corner, but that's the most difficult part, getting them off the chemicals and give them confidence and off the tillage. Because let's make it very clear so the audience understands some of the most destroyed soils I've ever seen in my are organic farms. Excessive tillage, too much tillage. And people would get mad at me because, and I buy organic, Matt. Go I figure. And, and so I don't want the chemicals on my, on my food. But they need, organic people, need to, we need to be honest about ourselves. You know, I, I love my organic farmers. I love my no-till farmers. I love my conventional. I don't care where you're at. My journey is to get you down the regenerative path. And just because you're organic does not mean you're regenerative. I went to our CSA because they had a farm tour day in Fresno in like 2013. And I was so excited. And I got there and I was flabbergasted. I was like, we got to go. And she's like, what do you mean? I was like, I can't control my facial expressions. She was like, what do you mean? I'm like, this soil is so bad. I can't believe we're eating this food. And she was like, oh, oh, 
And I'm like, I'm juicing this, these carrots and giving them to you, thinking that these are going to be the Gerson therapy carrots for fight your cancer. And now I'm looking right. at their soil and being like, there's no way this is good. You got it, Matt. Yeah. You got it. And best organic no-tiller vegetable grower that I know is Brian O'Hara and 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 also um, Elizabeth and Paul Kaiser. Yeah, uh, I love Elizabeth you know and Paul. That. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they do a great job. I've been, I saw their soils. It's organic, it's 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 organic no-till. Mm -hmm. and and they get blasted by the organic why aren't you tilling why aren't you moving the soil why aren't you touching messing it up and and that's the reality of it uh, we're very tribal and and so when i go walk on an operation i, I let the soil speak mm -hmm. i pull out that shovel and like and, and it'll speak to me it'll let me know where you're at and so that's and one of the things I do, Matt, and I think the audience, the first thing is uh, I had this organic farmer that, you know, his soils look pretty bad. And I was trying to tell him to use the right cover crop. He was using vetch. And I said, no, 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 you should be using, let's use some CRI because you need to put carbon into the system. Harry vetch is not going to do that for you. But it was so carbon depleted. He started arguing with me. And so I finally, and it got a little, we weren't yelling at each other. We didn't get, we just. We just stood our ground. So I said, well, I grabbed a shovel and I said, I said, come over here and let me show you something. I walked right to the edge of his field. He had this beautiful old, this is in California, around the Sacramento area. He had this old little grove of trees that had been there for 100 years, haven't been disturbed. I grabbed it and I said, this is, this is nature and this is your organic farm. The soil in his, that, that little wooded area, What's dark black emery. His organic farm was 10, 15 shades lighter, almost yellow looking. They were 50 feet apart, Matt. I said, this is your organic farm. He finally calmed down a little bit with me. He apologized and we got in the vehicle. He goes, Ray, you don't understand. I got everybody against me because I'm organic. Mm -hmm. I said, I get it. I said, but I'm just trying to help you. A shovel is the best way. I always walk to the edge of the field. And I said, and find a spot that has not been disturbed in 50 years. And I said, okay, this is, this is nature. This is the way creator does it. This is the way you do it. I did that with the, in Brazil with uh, sugar cane. It was like right at the edge and the agronomists were going. Think about this, Matt. I, I go to places where they have 30 agronomists on staff and they don't even use a shovel. Uh. I'm, I'm, that's what we're talking about, man. Yeah. I said, where's your soul? And in, 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 in Portugal, in Portuguese, Portuguese, it's pa. I said, where's your pa? Where's your shovel? And they looked at me like, what do you mean? What do you want a shovel for? That's where we're at, man. Wow. On a global scale. And and, and until you use those basic things, how to teach them, you can't go to that next step of regeneration. You've got to bring awareness first. And I let the, that's why the shovel is such a critical thing. And my little demos, I can't even send them to a class. Matt, you're like the next phase. You know, when, when I'm ready to bring the agronomist and, and they come to repentance of their destructive methods, then you bring them to the powers and you teach them the next level. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I hear you. And these are college educated uh, people that went to college for four or five years or even got their master's or even their PhDs, Matt. Yeah. That's where we're at. It's amazing um, how the problem we face is so human. It's like it's dealing with people, it's reaching people's hearts, it's getting people to put ego down let go of, 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 of firmly held beliefs. It's, it's, it's so much of that, that human deep connective work. I'm so glad that you have such a wonderful heart because they need someone with that to actually break that breakthrough for them because it is that holistic change. It's not, and it's not just money. I mean, you, you have to, it's a commitment that requires you to develop fluency in systems that, 
no one was even aware of. <laughs> well, the most it's part. true, man. It's true, man. I Carl Jung, he was a famous psychologist. He said, Swiss, uh, Swiss psychology said, the best way to teach others is to help others is to understand your darkness. Mm. Once you understand your darkness of your human nature, then you can be a better teacher. And once you understand that, that I have all these flaws and I have all these issues, that uh, it's for love of people and for land and, and what it does to people's lives to push you to go down this. This is why you just been, you wrote that, that book you wrote was, yeah, you get a financial benefit. Yes, you should get it. But it's also a, a mission of love. It takes a lot of, uh, of work to be a teacher. And you understand that. And, 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 and not everybody's designed that way, but we're all teachers at some degree and we're all students. But how do you communicate to people and how do you connect with them? It's very, very important. I absolutely agree. So where can folks learn more from you? Uh, my website will be up next month and, um, and it will be uh, Ray the Soul guy at life.com and um they can learn from me from there and you know matt they'll also be posted you i know you'll post that and you and i will uh continue to have this relationship and um and i'm going to post where i where i teach all over the country uh i'm booked the whole year uh uh to teach yeah i'm booked all over and That's uh yeah, yeah. It's growing because you know what, man? We're still at a very basic level. That's why I'm saying people like you in the teaching and 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 getting more teachers out there, bringing more awareness. We're just at the early stage. We're not we're not at that 13, 12, 13% yet. And even though cover crops has increased by 77% in our country and it continues to grow, we're not there yet. So we can't stop, you know. We're, I told my wife until God takes me back and, and takes me, you know, I'm not going to stop teaching this because it's too important. And, you know, I have a 155 acre farm here in Missouri and I bought that farm because I felt like if I'm teaching, I need to be living it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my sheep and my whole, uh, we're going to transition out of sheep. Now we're going to go to cattle because my wife wants to come with me to travel and, and I just don't have help to take care of the sheep because it requires the guard dogs and stuff. So I'm transitioning, but I have to have my garden. I have to have, I need to have skin in the game. You know, like Matt, you got your garden, you got skin in the game and people say, well, I don't have these big pieces. I don't care what your size of your land is. You get your hands in the soil, go grow a garden. I don't care if you have a little block of land, your backyard, or I don't care if you have 100,000 acres. I do not care. The, get some skin in the game and, and go share this information of Kiss the Ground documentary, A Common Ground, re, Roots So Deep, uh, the Biggest Little Farm. Start spreading the word around and, and, and start having the discussion and buy food, real food. And and if you want to really determine where it's coming from, grow it yourself. Mm -hmm. Go to tear, tear up that lawn in the back and grow your own food. You know, yeah, and grow your own food as much as possible. And that's how you you start uh, doing this and how we can connect. So, you know, Matt, I'm so thankful that you asked me to come and, and be on your podcast and um, able to connect with you. So that was very it meant a lot to me. It meant so much to me. I have uh, been following your work and for so many years. And when we met years ago at the in Missouri at the Midwest Organic Association yeah. conference, I it was like a, it was a huge moment. I mean, it was I was there, you, and, and it was Gabe, and it was you. You know, it was a big deal. <laughs> but then yeah. it was years since we were able to connect, and I had done so much work on soil. And it, yeah, it's just, it's a full circle moment for me. And so thank you for taking the time. Thank you for your mission. Thank you for your work. And thank you for keeping it connected to your heart and your faith. Because mm -hmm. 
everything I've studied, um, every everywhere I go to the 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 DNA or the microscope, it all comes back to that human conversation at the end of the day. How are you going to reach that person on a human level so that they can have the room to back up and back out of the position they're in to go to a new place? Because if we don't provide the 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 pivot room for people and we just push them and judge them, they're never going to be able to change. And right. we and, and especially farmers, I mean, everyone's had an opinion about a farmer and expressed it very loudly for decades. And farmers are, you know, they're sensitive because of that. And so th we yeah. really need people in there like you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. And um, thank you for your work. And I, you know, and I was leaving this thought here. When I, when I walk into a farmer's play, farmer's operation, or I walk into an operation, it's like being invited to their home. It's very, it was very personal. I've always felt like that when I worked with the agency with USDA, when they asked me to go to their farm, it's like being asked to their living room. It's like almost opening their checkbook and saying, opening their heart, their soul, because that, that that's what they do as a living. And so it's a very personal thing to, uh, to be involved in people's lives and to be part of a, a, just a catalyst. I'm just a messenger. I'll drop seed. You know, I may drop the seed, Matt powers waters, but at the end of the day, the glory goes to God because he makes it grow. So thank you for, uh, uh, for allowing me here to share our, our mission. Uh, your mission, my mission, uh, and a lot of people. And it's just not me. It's a collective that have done this. There's a lot of people in the background that were involved. And and those people that when we create those workshops and the people that are um, uh, making the food, signing up, uh, writing the name tags, doing all that hard work, they too as a collective, all of us, even the most mundane things contribute to the health of the planet. So thank, thank you, Matt, for, for sharing and, and help me and having me be part of this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ray. That was awesome. You're welcome, Matt. And this is the book that Ray is talking about when he's saying your book. This is Regenerative Soil. This is the second edition. I highly recommend you, if you don't know this book, that you check it out. There's a reason why Ray wants to use this in his teaching. There's a reason why David Holmgren, co-originator co of Permaculture, recommends this book. This is a special book. It's a breakthrough book. And if you haven't checked it out, you can click the link below and you can see inside it and see what I'm talking about and see if you need it. Because if you rely upon soil, if you work with plants, if you're growing anything, you need this book. All right, I'm Matt Powers. Grow abundantly, learn daily, and live regeneratively. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next time.